Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah this morning, the Most High. We get up to say Shema, Israel, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Hukad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. And bless your name. They should ever leave and born a new womb. Please don't close the door on me. Yeah, I should go astray. I know you love, you love me. Come someday. Yeah, I should ever Shimmy Aretz 
We got one more day to just be in the presence of the Most High God. After coming out of the feast of Sukkot. I don't know about anybody else. But the feast of tabernacle. Tabernacle with the most high God. Was amazing. Especially after Sabbath teaching. On true worship to the most high. Oh my goodness. Are you checking everything that you do now? After listening and you know that teaching on true worship to the most high. We have to be very careful or we'll find ourselves idolizing some things or we'll be doing pagan idolatry worship, not the worship that the most high God has taught us how to worship. So I'm excited. That the Most High keeps giving us revelation. I'm talking about revelation will have your understanding to just blow your mind. And it gives you the wisdom to walk out some things. I mean, it really makes you understand the difference between thank you and having gratitude. Come on now. Y'all got to get up this morning with me and begin to understand that the Most High God is bringing us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's lighted up some things in our lives that we may see because that's what the Torah is. The Torah is light. You ain't know the Torah was light. From the very beginning, he said, let there be light. And there was light. The Torah is light. And not only is it light, Yeshua, the word made flesh, once he stepped on the scene, he said, I came that you should have life. And that you should have life. More abundantly. So not only is the Torah is light. It'll light some things up for you. And especially in your life. And you begin to understand this thing is a lifestyle. You be like oh Lord. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm being shown some things that I was never taught before. So I'm going to have to unlearn some stuff. And realize for surely. We have inherited our forefathers lives. So this morning. We continue on our journey of destroying all the lies that the enemy ever told. You know he told the first lie. He's the father of all lies. So we come today with no man knows the hour. Huh? Yeah. No man knows the hour. As we walk through the scriptures to get our understanding, line upon line, precept upon precept, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let me tell you one thing. If you don't have the law, the prophets, and the writings, you got a false doctrine. You better know he said out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let it be established. Come on now. If two or three touch and agree, if two touch and agree on anything, it shall be done. You got to have your witnesses. Show up to court without witnesses if you want to. Oh, you don't have any witnesses? No. Well, then we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to regroup. <laughs> and you're going to have to go get you some witnesses because we're going to need some witnesses. If nobody saw this but you, how we know is truth. So a lot of times we adopted man-made Doctrine. We've been indoctrinated. Y'all better come on and know. We've been indoctrinated yes, yes. with their theology from their Greek philosophy. Because we know that the New Testament is Greek translation. And so if scripture was written in Hebrew, we might want to check the Hebrew. So we've been indoctrinated. We've been, you know, keeping the commandments of men. The dogmas of men. So therefore, we have to strip down every lie that was ever told. And I don't care if you was taught it in school. Just because you were taught by Greek philosophers doesn't make it the truth. So we come to destroy every lie that was ever told. So you better put on your Holy Ghost seatbelt this morning. Because we're going for a ride, Doreen. Good morning, Doreen. Bless you, beautiful one. You better put on your Holy Ghost seatbelt because we're going for a ride this morning. The most I said, I ain't going to have you ignorant. You will no longer be ignorant of Hasatan devices. 
My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Now come on and yield to his will. Walk in the teachings and instructions of the Most High God. And that's going to take a change, y'all. Come on now. That's going to take a conversion. That's going to take a transformation. That's going to take a renewing of your mind. That's going to take a stripping of yourself. You know you got to unwrap yourself from yourself. Because yourself just keep popping up. I don't know about nobody else. After I heard that teaching on worship, I begin to walk a certain kind of way. I was like, oh, hold up now. Am I like worshiping myself? Let me make sure, you know, because everything, I'm about the creator and not the creation. That's the problem. I was saying that on Sabbath. A lot of times, you know, we are worshiping creation more than we are the creator. We want relationships more with people than we want with the most high God. It seems like we will search out people and we'll try to get that thing right with people. And the most high God say, hey, what about me? Because you still ain't got some things right with me. What about me? I am the creator. How you going to trust the resource above the source? Huh? There would be no resource without the source. So we got to go back to the old landmark and begin to teach the word of the most high God. Teach means to train and instruct. It's trying to be taught some things, y'all. Come on, let's cast down those vain imaginations. And those vain ima imaginations is yourself. Ugh. Uh-huh. Cast down vain imaginations that exalt itself against the knowledge of the Most High God. And take those thoughts captive. I love him. Don't you love him? I mean, I love him. And we got an eighth day, because I am the eighth day. We got a new beginning. And then we going into Sim Torah, the joy of giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. I love his feast days. I don't know about nobody else, because everything he does, he does it by his law. So you better realize that. Everything the Most High God does, he does it by his law. Okay. So let's go on and destroy some lies this morning. I can see y'all right now. Mouth's going to be wide open. Y'all going to be like this, huh? What? Yeah, right. Just like that. So get ready for the, huh? What? What? Yes. I love him. Because he come to take the scales off of your eyes. You ain't going to be blind no more. You going to say, I once was blind, but now I see, honey. I once was blind, but now I see. Lord, have mercy. Who most high? How come lifting up everyone on Facebook Live this morning? The ones that are live right now listening to your word. Because your word does not return void. Neither shall it be reversed. And it will do exactly what you sent it to do. Ooh, shimmy our it. All right now. Holy Ghost. Who Lord. We just want to yield to your will. We want to bow down and worship you. Because study is the highest form of worship in Hebrew. So we've come to worship. We come to yada. We come to know right now and blow a kiss to the most high God. Because you are the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you right now, Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, that you would lead and guide me into all truth. Oh, Lord, you know I'm not sufficient of myself. All sufficiency lies on the inside of you. And I will forever give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And it's in the mighty, mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, I pray. Amen, 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 and amen. Mwah. Lord, after I learned that on Sabbath, I was like, mm-mm, I'll be blowing kisses all day. All right now, most high God. The word says, if two or three gather together in his name, that he would be in the midst. The word says, if two touch and agree on anything, it shall be done. And I know I can't do nothing this morning without this word being established through the law, the prophets, and the right. So the method style of study is a process of studying the word of Ahia, Asha, Ahia, which is I am that I am in Hebrew. The great I am, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we seek his guidance 
and live in a kingdom lifestyle. The Torah is God's teachings and instructions in 613 principles. It's what the Creator speaks, Mother. And then we search the witnesses through the books of the prophets that never ends, and the books of the writings, the Ketavins. Collectively, the Torah, the never ends, and the Ketavins are identified as the Tanakh, or as some refer to it, the Old Testament, which is the only book that Yeshua studied in reference throughout the New Testament. Genesis chapter 18, verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Most High God? Right. At the time appointed, I will return unto thee. According to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Today we look to the word time. Hebrews number 6256F. Time. Of an event, experience, fortunes, occurrences, occasion. The Torah testifies. Deuteronomy chapter 3 verse 21. And I commanded Joshua at that time saying, Thou eyes have seen all that the most high your God has done unto these two kings. So shall the Lord. Do unto all the kingdoms whether thou passest. Isaiah chapter 18 verse 7. Come on the prophets proclaim. In that time shall the present be born unto the Lord. Of hosts. Of a people scattered and peeled. And from a people terrible. From their beginning here or true. A nation. Meted out and trotted underfoot whose land the rivers have spoiled to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, the Mount Zion. Yes. The writings, bear witness. Psalm chapter 69, verse 13. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Most High, in an acceptable time. O Most High God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me, in the truth of thou, salvation. We have completed the method style of study this morning, reviewing time. First, we recognize the standard set in the Torah in 613 principles. Then we search the witnesses in the books of the prophets, the never ends, and the books of the writings, the Ketavins, collectively, the Torah, the never ends, and the Ketavins, or identify as the Tanakh. Or as some refer to it, the Old Testament, which is the only book that Yeshua studied in reference throughout the New Testament. 5 a.m. prayer. For the Most High exists outside of time. There is nothing that is a surprise to him. Huh? Because time is the kingdom's currency. Daniel chapter 11, verse 14. And in those times, there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. But they shall fall. Shalom, Allah King. Peace be unto you, 5 a.m. prayer community. When we trust in his plan and timing, we find that all that has been set against us is always destined to fail. Hold fast to he who never stumbles nor wavers. Oh, Lord, this is the eighth day, the appointed time by the Most High God, that when the children of Israel had tabernacle for seven days, Oh, they were so sad. They didn't want the most high God to leave. So he said, you know what? Keep the party going. <laughs> I'm going to stay with you one more day. And today, October the 21st, it's Shimmy as a rest. So the seven days of Sukkot, 
the in that in with Ho Hoshana Rabalt are immediately followed by another holiday called Shimmy Aretz. Referred to in the Torah in Numbers chapter 29, verse 35, simply as the eighth day. Today is the eighth day. This is a new beginning. You might want to change up some things in this day. You might want to look at this day differently. You might have do some things about yourself that you would never do before. You might want to change your mind, your direction. Because today is the eighth day. Simply as an eighth day of assembly. The sages interpret this to mean that the most high God asks all he who made pilgrimage for Sukkot to tarry. Uh-oh, not to wait. To tarry. Aretz, which comes from the Hebrew root, meaning to hold back with him. For one additional day. Come on, most high God. I got one additional day. And I'm thankful for it. So, in Israel, Shimearetz and Sim Katora are both celebrated on Tisserie 22. But in the Deplora communities outside of Israel, Shimearetz is observed on Tisserie 22, and Sim Katora on Tisserie 23. In the Dispora, Shimei Aretz is considered a full holiday, Yom Tov, but none of the particular mitzvah regarding Sukkot are observed. Though some Jews still eat in their Sukkans, while others do not. <clears throat> However, since it is a separate holiday... The usual rituals such as candle lighting, saying kiddish, reframing from work, attending special synagogue services are practiced. So, Shimei Aretz basically is the eighth day, and, but it's also asking for the prayer for rain. Huh? Shimei Aretz is perhaps best known for the Talit Gohim or the prayer for rain recited during the Muso service in the morning. The prayer for rain is inserted in the second session of the Amidah, where the phrase Mara Ha Ruach, you Marie Hajim, which makes the wind blow and makes the rain descend. What you say? Which makes the wind blow and makes the rain descend. Okay. It's added to the blessing. That's why we was having a windstorm in Colorado on yesterday. You had to hold on to your hair. You better come on. This additional, this addition to the wording of the Amida is hereafter recited unto Pesach. But why formalize a prayer for rain? In Israel, crops planted in the spring depend on the rainfall that occurs in the fall. Moreover, according to the Hebrew tradition, all the world is judged at this time regarding the amount of rainfall to be given for the coming year. Therefore, beginning with Shimei Aretz, additional prayers for rain are made part of the synagogue service through the additional Addition to the Amidah. So, we are in the eighth day. Shimmy, Aretz. So y'all get happy right now, because this is your new beginning. Hallelujah, and bless your name. So now, are you ready for the word of God? The father of Abraham. The father of Isaac, the father of Jacob. Are you ready for the word of God? The father of Abraham, the father of Isaac, the father of Jacob. This morning we are coming out of the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 24 
in its entirety. Okay, this morning, we are coming out of the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 24 in its entirety, and it reads, And Yeshua went out and departed from the temple. And his town Medes came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Yeshua said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the Talmudians came upon him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thou coming? And of the end of the world. And Yeshua answered and said unto him, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes and diver places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, shall rise. And shall deceive many. And because of lawlessness, iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. In this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Come on and teach the Torah. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Right. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child. And to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter. Neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulations, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show you great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. For as the lightning come out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, 
so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the Caucasus is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his messengers with a great sound of the chauffeur. And they shall gather together his elects from the four winds and from one end of the heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put his forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye when ye see all these signs, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. Now y'all know y'all been taught this. Come on now. But as that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving into marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the son of man be. Then shall too be in the field. The one shall be taken, and the other left. One going to be in the Torah, and one going to be left. All right now. Two women shall be grinding at the meal. The one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. This ain't about no rapture. This is about walking in the Torah. There's come a time for separation. Yeah. Watch, therefore, for ye Know not what hour your Lord does come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would have not suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give meat in due season? Lord, blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But in if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of the servant of that servant shall come in a day, and when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, ooh Lord, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Ooh, Lord. That was 51 verses just in case you didn't know. May the most high God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his most holy word. Yom to 
Yeshua. The day that no man knows. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 through 37. But of that day and hour knows no man, no, not the Malak, angels of heaven. But my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Many of us have read the famous quote of our Mashiach in the Gospels when he declared that his second coming would be at a time that no man knows. Yet, how many of us knew that he was actually making a reference to the Feast of Trumpets that we just came out of. You better come on down. Yeah. When he spoke this Hebrew idiom. Did you even know that? This is a Hebrew idiom. But the church has built a total message doctrine of a no man knows the hour. Oh, yeah. But it's a Hebrew idiom. Ah, I thought you would ask. Dr. J, what is an idiom? Mm -hmm. Okay, since you asked. An idiom is an expression that does not make sense in other languages other than the one being spoken. Well. Here is an example of an idiom in English. It's raining cats and dogs outside. <laughs> Come on now. Teach them, most high God. Here is an example of an idiom in English. It's raining cats and dogs outside. Everyone knows when this expression is being used. There are not actually cats and dogs falling out of the sky. It is an expression that means it's raining very heavily and only those who speak English would understand this. Come on, most high God. <laughs> However, in any other language, it does not make sense. And such is the case with the Hebrew idiom for the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets was known by those in ancient Israel as the day that no man knows. Uh-oh. Wake up, y'all. Wake up. Y'all better start sharing this video right now. Your pastor might have not known that's what they were talking about. The Feast of Trumpets was known by those in ancient Jerusalem as the day that no man knows. And why was this feast nicknamed by this Hebrew idiom? Come on, Doreen. Idiom. It is because this is the only feast that is determined by the sighting of the new moon. Therefore, no man can calculate the exact day nor the hour of when it begins. Right. To the Lord. In ancient Jerusalem, there would be two witnesses who would stand on the walls of Jerusalem and watch for the first sliver crescent of the new moon. When the Father in heaven decided to allow the new moon to appear in the sky, then these two witnesses would sound the shofar. And all the people in the city would immediately drop what they were doing and they would run towards the temple for the celebration of the day of the blowing. Or in Hebrew, it was called Yom Tura. Wow. If you don't know this word Hebraically, you don't know the Mashiach. What God have you been serving? We come to destroy all the lies because he said many Christ will come and they are here now. The temple doors 
were only open for a short period of time. And if they failed to make it to the temple before the doors were shut, those who slept in running to the temple were left out. Once the doors were shut, nobody could get in. Because this feast was to begin at sundown. They had to make sure that there was all lamps were filled so that they could find their way in the dark towards the temple. Because this feast was to begin at sundown, they had to make sure that their oil lamps were filled so they could find their way in the dark towards the temple. In those days, there were no street lights. So they had to carry their oil lamps to help them find their way once it grew dark. In Matthew chapter 25, our Mashiach told us a parable about 10 virgins. Only five of these virgins were wise and had their oil lamps filled when the bridegroom came. However, the five foolish virgins had not prepared themselves by filling their lamps with oil. When the day that no man knows had arrived. The two witnesses sounded the shofar and the five wise virgins were ready to go into the marriage. Much to their peril, the foolish virgins had no oil in their lamps and consequently they could not see their way around in the dark. Wake up church. The foolish virgins were admonished to go and buy oil for their lamps, which caused them to be too late for the feast. When the temple doors were shut, the five foolish virgins were left out. Many of these inhabitants of Jerusalem would be working in the fields or grinding at the mill in Matthew chapter 24, verse 40 through 42. And when they heard the sound of the chauffeur, they knew that their work was finished. Our Mashiach was speaking in the language of Feast of Trumpets. Our Mashiach we're speaking in the language of the Feast of Trumpets. Type typology when he said that we must work while it is yet day. For the night comes when no man can work. John chapter 9 verse 24. Those who were working in the fields had to run towards the temple before the doors were shut. The person who was alert and listening for the trumpet would be taken by the alarm. This was his signal to run towards the temple. However, those who were not alert and not watching would not hear the sound of the shofar. And they would be left in the field or grinding at the mill. Unaware that the day had come. Who oh Lord. Yeshua. Likened himself. To the thief in the night. Another lie we've been told. Who would come at an hour. That no man knows. For these people who were not watching. With their oil lambs filled. Sudden destruction. Will come upon them as a woman in travail, and it would be too late for them to escape the wrath of Yeshua. All right. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. The thief in the night. Huh? The thief in the night. We often make reference to this term, thief. In the night, from the scriptures, 
But how many really know what the metaphor of the thief in the night is all about? In order to understand this metaphor, we must know historically where this term came from. In ancient Jerusalem, the high priest in the temple called uh, calling her Gadol would make his rounds each night to make sure that the other priests were doing their duty of keeping the fire burning on the brazen altar. The commandment in the Torah was to never allow this fire on the altar to go out. Leviticus chapter 6 verse 13. If a priest was on duty to watch the fire by night, he was not allowed to fall asleep on the job. If he fell asleep, the fire would not stay stoked with wood and it would go out, thereby bringing judgment on the entire nation of Israel. The priest were also commanded not to have wine or straw drink while serving in the temple. Leviticus chapter 10 verse 9. Alcohol in their bloodstream would defile their worship and cause them to become drunk, lazy, and sleepy. Because the cold Haggadah high priest came at an hour when they were least expecting him to show up, the priest began to nickname the thief in the night. If the priest on duty fell asleep and was not watching the fire on the brazen altar, the high priest would show up and find him sleeping on the job. The high priest would then take some hot coals from the altar and scoop them up with a shovel. He would then dump some of these hot coals onto the priest's garment who had fallen asleep. The priest would have fallen asleep, would be suddenly awakened by the smell of hot burning coals on his garments on fire. He would immediately strip off his clothes as fast as he could in order to prevent from being burned. At the end of his shift, the other priest would see him naked without garments and would be ashamed. This is because all the other priests would know that he was caught falling asleep on the job. Yeshua is our high priest. After the order of Melchizedek, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 17 through 21, and his true followers are his royal priesthood. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, we are admonished not to be like those priests who fell asleep on the job. We are given a command to watch and keep our garments so that we will not be ashamed when our Mashiach returns. Now we can better understand his warning to us in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 16 verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame wow. what you say in his letter to the renewed covenant believers and mashiach the apostle paul wrote to them you have no need that i write to you concerning the time and the seasons. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 1. What did he mean by this statement? Huh? What did he mean by this statement? 
In order to understand what Paul was saying here, we must understand that the Hebrew word for times and seasons is mo'odim. Come on, Shimmy, all right? It's the eighth day. He's giving you a new beginning today to understand no man knows the hour. In order to understand what Paul was saying here, we must understand that the Hebrew word for times and seasons is mo'odim. The word mo'odim is plural for the Hebrew word Mom as seen in the Hebrew courts. All right. Hebrews number 4550. Five, Moet or Moet or feminine. Moadat. In 2 Chronicles chapter 8, verse 13. Properly, an appointment, fixed time or season, specify a festival. Conventionally, a year by implication, an assembly, technically the congregation, by extinction, the place of meeting, also a signal, appointed, sign, time, place of solemn assembly, congregation, set solemn feast, appointed due season, solemnly, synagogue, set time, appointed. All right. Why did Paul? have no need to write to them about these things. Why did Paul have no need to write to them about these things? Because they were all keeping the Sabbath in the days of the feast of Yeshua. What you say? Because they were all keeping the Sabbath and the feast days, the appointed times of Yeshua. Okay, Mosai. First Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the days of the Most High God so comes as a thief in the night. Oh Lord. Paul and the Thessalonians were well aware of this metaphor concerning the high priest and the thief in the night. They practiced these things in the temple year after year and there was no need to explain it to them. Right. If they continue to keep the appointed Mo'odim of Yeshua as he had commanded them to do forever they would not be taken by surprise 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 3 for when they shall say peace and safety then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. Paul knew that these followers of Mashiach were not in darkness because they were keeping their all lamps filled and ready for the day when it arrived. They would not be taken by the day that no and their lamps their high priest, Yeshua, would come not as a thief in the night for them because they would not be in darkness. Oh, my goodness. I think he just took the scales off of our eyes and we are no longer in darkness. I once was blind, but now I see. Who, hmm. yes, yes. Lord? First Thessalonians chapter 5. Verses 4 and 5. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. That, 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 that day should not overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. The Hebrew word. For day 
is yum, uh, which means the following. Yum, from an unused root meaning to be hot, a day, as the warm hours, whether literal from sunrise to sunset, continually, everlasting season. The Hebrew word for light, stop it, most high, is seen in the strong Hebrew quarters as number 216, or which means the following, light, light of day, light of the heavenly luminaries, like the moon, the sun, and the stars, daybreak, dawn, morning light, light of the lamp, light of life, light of prosperity, light of instruction. Yes, yes. Huh? As you can see, when we get our menorah, because Hanukkah's on the way. When we get our menorah, come on now. Hey, hey, hey. The seven branch menorah, each light on the lamp represents a feast day or an appointed yum. Paul was telling us. That because we are children of the light and of the day, we will be walking in our master's instructions, Torah, and the light or revelation that is given to us when we keep his feast. Shimmy Horitz. Oh, Lord. Huh? As priests. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. In the order of Melchizedek, we must not be like those priests who would be found drinking alcohol on the job, getting drunk and falling asleep. We are given clear warning. Oh, come on down. Here to watch and to be sober. The Greek word here for sober is nevo which literally means to abstain from wine. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6 through 9. We breaking it down for you, baby. We breaking it down for you. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober. Put it on the breastplate of faith and love. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For the Most High has not appointed us to wrath but to abstain salvation by our Mashiach Yeshua HaMashiach oh my goodness the breastplate being spoken of here is oh Lord to be chosen the priest's breastplate that he wore for the twelve 12 tribes of Israel. Ooh, Lord, those of us who are ready will be made king and priest in the new millennium kingdom of our Mashiach as seen in Revelations chapter 1 verse 6 and Revelations 5 verse 10. For the bride who is walking in the light and the truth of scripture, she must go through tribulation as part of the purifying process to be made ready without spot or wrinkle. Daniel chapter 12, verse 10. Revelations chapter 3, verse 8. Revelations chapter 7, verse 14. The Hebrew word for tribulation is in the Strong's Concordance 6862 Tazar. From the Hebrew, 6887, narrow, as a noun, a tight place, usually figurative, trouble, also a pebble, 
as in 6864. An opponent, adversary, afflicted, affliction, anguish, clothes, distress, enemy, flint, foe, narrow, small, sorrow, straight, tribulation, trouble. And the Hebrew concordance, number 6869, Tazar, Tara, feminine, or in the Hebrew concordance, 6862, tightness, figuratively, trouble, trance, trance, vividly, a feminine, rival, adversary, affliction, anguish, distress, tribulation, trouble. This means that the bride must go through the birth canal. Huh? Katitia. This means that the bride must go through the birth canal to be birthed into immorality and corruption. Rachel and Leah were sisters who were rivals because they both loved the same man, Jacob. Rachel represents the house of Judah and Leah represents the house of Ephraim. Both groups Jews and Gentiles must go through a time of sister rivalries in order to provoke one another to jealousy and thus be purified to meet the groom, the bridegroom. The bride is not appointed for the day of Yeshua's wrath, for she will be changed, birth, as she puts in in corruption. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. As children of the light, the bride orders the holy feast that Yeshua has commanded her to keep forever because they are holy convocations. The Strong's Hebrew Cordance defines the word for convocation as follows. Hebrews number 4744. Marat Mukro. From the Hebrew 7121, something called out. Public meeting, the act, the persons, or the place. Also a rehearsal, assembly, calling, convocation, reading. As we can see, or as you can see, the feasts of Yeshua are called a rehearsal. What are we rehearsing for when we keep the feasts? Huh? So as you can see, the feasts of Yeshua are called rehearsals. So what are we rehearsing when we keep the feast? When we keep his feast, we are memorializing and rehearsing all aspects of the betrothal engagement and the future marriage supper of the Lamb. Oh Lord. When Yeshua established an everlasting covenant with Israel, he gave us a sign that he alone was our most high God. What exactly is this sign that he has given to all Israel for all generations forever? The sign that our creator has given us of our everlasting covenant with him are his Sabbaths. Yes. When we read scripture, it's describing not only a seven day of the week, but also the seven annual Sabbath or festivals outlined in Leviticus chapter 23. The Most High declares that through Sabbath, we might know that he is Yeshua who sanctifies us and sets us apart. Yes. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the most high God that sanctified them. Yes. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 20. And hollow my Sabbath, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the most high God, your God. 
Leviticus chapter 23, verse 23 through 25. And the Most High spoke unto Moshe, Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no civil work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Most High. So in these verses and scriptures, we can see that Yeshua is commanding us to have a memorial of blowing of trumpets every year on the first day of the seventh month of Tishri, and he calls it a holy convocation. Yeah, yeah. In other words, a wedding rehearsal. Wow. The offering that we make to him on this day is an offering made by fire. In other words, our own lives are presented to him as a living sacrifice. We allow the fire of the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, to purge and purify our lives so that we will be ready for the day when he returns to catch away the bride. Yeshua is coming for a bride without spot. Or blemish. We must be purified by the suffering trials and tribulations in order to be ready for the day that no man knows. At the conclusion of the 1,260 days ministry of the two witnesses, the seventh angel will sound come on now i'm talking about in revelations chapter 11 verse 15 will sound and then the bride shall be changed in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet yeah. revelations chapter 11 verse 12 through 15 and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them come up hither and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our masters and of his Mashiach, and he shall reign forever and ever. There are four different trumpets. Blasts sounded on the Feast of Trumpets. And the fourth represents the four corners of the earth, the harvest field, and the four angels, and the four winds of heaven. Revelations chapter 7, verse 1. And after these things, I saw a fourth angel standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. These four types of trumpet blasts are the this kind of sound. Trumpet number one, the tihak, a pure unbroken sound that calls man to search his heart, forsake his wrong ways, and seek forgiveness, forgiveness through teshuva. Trumpet number two, the shabarian, a broken Sakot, a trembling sound. It templifies the sorrows that comes to man when he realizes his misconduct and desires to change his ways. It sounds like a man mourning in Teshuvah. Mm. Trumpet number three, the Teshuvah, Yom Tura, a wave-like sound of alarm calling upon man to stand by the banner of the Most High God. Trumpet number four, the Tika Goel, the prolonged unbroken sound, templifying a final appeal to a sincere teshuva and atonement. The fourth trumpet is the last trumpet sound made on the Feast of Trumpets. And this represents the four angels from the four winds of heaven and the four corners of the earth as they gather their elect in Matthew chapter 24 verse 29 through 31. Yes. Oh Lord. Oh Lord. 
Oh, Lord. Okay. Am I stopping? Am I going? Because I could go. Oh, Lord. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's it. Read that and stop. Okay. Oh, Lord. The ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony. How does it picture Mashiach Yeshua and his bride? The ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony. How does it picture Mashiach Yeshua and his bride? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Behold, I stay at the door and knock. A Hebrew betrothal supper was the accumulation of often years of already established relationship, handling and planning between both of the families of the bride and the groom. The bride had the final say and whether or not she desired to marry the bridegroom. And this was played out in the, step, in the first steps of the betrothal ceremony. The groom and his father would come to the bride's house on that special prearranged night and knock on the door of their home. Come on now, y'all got to understand this. A Hebrew betrothal supper was the accumulation of often years of already established relationship, haggling and planning between both of the families of the bride and groom. The bride had the final say and whether or not she desired to marry the groom. And this was played out in the first step of the betrothal ceremony. The groom and his father would come to the bride's house on that special pre-arranged night and knock on the door of their home. Good morning, beautiful. The father of the bride would inquire who was there and then ask the bride if he should let them in. When she said yes, the open door for the process of the covenant had begun. This can be compared to our acceptance of Mashiach when he knocks on the door of our hearts. Revelations chapter 3 verse 20 reflects the beginning of the Hebrew betrothal process when Yeshua says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. In John chapter 14, verse 2 and 3, in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 through 44. But of the day and hour knows no man. No, not the angels of heaven. But my father only, therefore, be also ready for in such an hour as you think not the son of man, the son of man comes. Matthew chapter 25 verse 10. The bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Revelations chapter 19, verse 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her who granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness, the set apart one saints. In John chapter 3, verse 29, John the Immersa Baptist 
referring to himself as the friend of the bridegroom and to Yeshua as the bridegroom said, he that has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hear him rejoices greatest because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. Boy, that just jumped in the scripture. That just jumped in the scripture. We ain't never read that before. What you say, John? John said, friend of the bridegroom and to Yeshua, as the bridegroom said, he that has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatest because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Psalms chapter 45, verse 9. Upon your right hand, Yeshua, did stand the queen in gold of Kohal. Matthew chapter 20, verse 23. And he said unto them, You shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared for, prepared of my father. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 8 through 14, we read the parable of the gathering of the guests of the wedding. They must be invited and must have on a wedding garment. The wedding garment is made of pure white linen, which is the righteousness or set apart ones. The word of the Most High is basically the story of a wedding. What? The word of the Most High it's basically a story of a wedding from start to finish. That's the reason why we keep rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing. Because the story of the Most High God is basically a wedding from start to finish. It is a love story of a loving father seeking the perfect bride for his son, Yeshua. He is searching for a bride who is totally devoted, pure of heart, in love only with him, submitted and perfect in his sight. Such a picture of this is found in Genesis chapter 24, verse 1 through 67. With Abraham sending out his servant, Eleazar, a type of Holy Spirit, all right now, to find the perfect bride for his son, Isaac. Interestingly, the name Eleazar, also spelled Eleazar, means Elom is my helper. In the basic structure of the ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony, you will see the heavenly father and the bridegroom Yeshua sending the servant, which is the Ruach HaKadosh, Holy Spirit. The attendant of the bride is Moshe, representing the Torah. And the attendant of the groom is Elijah, representing the spirit of prophecy. And then there are the guests who are redeemed people, but they are not the bride. In most weddings, there are three groups of people. In most weddings, there are three groups of people. One, the guests forming the largest group. Two, the attendants of the bride and the groom, usually a small group. Number three, the bride and her bridegroom. All are content and happy within their situation. 
but only the bride gets to go into the hoopla bridal chamber with the bridegroom in the new Jerusalem on Mount Zion and live in his house forever. She has an intimacy with him that no one else has. The bride goes away with him for a seven day wedding, just like Leah and Jacob. As seen in Genesis chapter 29, verse 27 and 28, their wedding lasted for seven days. And at the end of seven days, Jacob was also given Rachel as a wife. Leah represents the 10 northern tribes of Israel. For Leah had 10 children. Note, Leah had six of her own sons naturally. In Genesis chapter 35, verse 26. And she also had two sons born to her by her handmaiden, Zephar. In Genesis chapter 30, verse 10 through 12. This was a total of eight sons. However, after Rachel died, giving birth to Benjamin, Leah then became the mother of Benjamin and Joseph. And so they were also considered the sons of Leah. This is how we arrive at the idea that Leah had 10 sons. The two sons of Rachel born by her, by her handmaiden, Malal, were still considered the sons of Rachel because they had their own mother, Malal, to take care of them. This is how we arrive at the fact that Rachel had two sons. These 10 northern tribes later on become known as the house of Ephraim and they have Gentile companions. They are joined to them as born again believers. In Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 16, Rachel represents the two southern tribes of Judah the Hebrew people, because Rachel had two sons. And so the bride who is templified in Leah will be caught up to meet him in the air on Yom Turah in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. And then she will be taken into the hoopla, the bridal chamber, for seven days. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 11, the two witnesses will be killed and their bodies will lie in the streets for three and a half days. I believe that this is the keeping of the pattern of their Mashiach who also three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew chapter 12 verse 40. During the 10 days between the two feasts of trumpets and atonement, the first three of these days are when the bride follows the same pattern as her bridegroom. She must die to her own sinful body and then be raised up on the third day. Oh Lord, hallelujah. So no one knows for sure the day or the hour of the beginning of the Hebrew month until it happens. And in some instances, until a day after the fact. This is why rabbinical tradition teaches that every Yom Tua, which they also call Rock Hashanah, must be kept for two consecutive days. In ancient times, a negative sighting, non-sighting of the new moon could be confirmed on the third day of the month because they had to wait for a potential new moon witnesses to arrive from the north of the country. Also, the new moon court was not allowed to meet on a holiday. Every year, they would observe Yom Tura on two consecutive days, but then fix the dates for Yom Kippur and Sukkot based on the testimony of the witnesses. The modern rabbinical calendar fixes the beginning of Yom Tura based on the average lunar conjunction, no moon, but still preserves the traditions of observing it on two consecutive days. 
A practice that obviously goes back to the time when they sighted the moon with the naked eye. So, then for the next seven days, she will be in the bridal chamber with her bridegroom. And at the end of seven days, she will return on the Day of Atonement, a.k.a. Yom Kippur. This is when Mashiach will also be married to the other bride, Templify and Rachel. This is when the Hebrews who were sealed will finally see their Mashiach face to face. And they will look upon him whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for her only son. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. During the 10 days between Yom Torah and Yom Kippur, the Hebrew people to this as the 10 days of awe, these 10 days between the feasts of trumpets, Yom Torah, and the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, also refers to the 10 days of tribulation for the congregation of Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. Smyrna represents the bride who will be converted until he returns. This is why she must suffer tribulation for 10 days. After the seven-day wedding with the first bride, Templify and Leah, the bridegroom will then return and he will marry the other bride, Templify and Rachel. Rachel represents the Hebrews who have not yet recognized Yeshua as their Mashiach until he returns. But they will be sealed in advance in the foreheads because they will not take the mark of the beast, nor will they worship his image. In Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4 and Revelation chapter 7 verse 3, when Mashiach comes back on a white horse, his army is also his bride, Templified and Leah, who is also riding on white horses, and she is clothed in white linen, fine and clean. Revelations chapter 19, verse 7 through 14. The bride, Templify, and Rachel must suffer 10 days of tribulation during what is called the 10 days of Ah. The word for Ah is the Hebrew number 7264 and the Hebrew strong quarters and is the word Razad, which means trouble to provoke. During these 10 days, the other bride, Templify, and Rachel will be provoked to jealousy. In Romans chapter 11, verse 11, as she realizes that her sister has been taken into the hoopla ahead of her with the bridegroom. In Leviticus chapter 16, we read the instructions for the high priest each year as we find out that he was commanded to mingle the blood of a bull with the blood of a goat. In Leviticus chapter 16, verse 15, then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 18, and he shall go out unto the altar that the most high and make atonement for it. And he shall take the blood of the bullock and the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar round about. What is interesting is that Leah's name means cow, bullock, and Rachel's name means lamb, goat. What does this templify? Templology means. It means that on the final day of Yom Kippur, our Mashiach will act as high priest Kordin Gahol who will mix the blood of these two families, two brides together, and he will make them one bride or one stick in his hand. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 16, 17 through 18, 19. Come on, most high God. Moreover, you son of man, take you one stick tree and run upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick tree, run on it, for Joseph, the stick tree of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions, and join them one to another into one tree, and they shall become one in your hand. And when the children of your people shall speak unto you, saying, Will you not show us 
what you mean by these, say unto them. Thus says the Most High, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one tree, and they shall be one in my hand. Who oh, Lord, hallelujah, and bless his name. Hallelujah, and bless his name. So, as you can see from the prophecy, the house, the two houses, of Israel will be made one or one bride on that day. At the end of the millennium, there will be a new heaven and a new earth in Revelation chapter 21 verse 1, which will come down out of heaven. There will be a new Jerusalem who will be adored as a bride for her husband. The bride is the one who overcomes as she is mentioned in Revelations chapter 3 verse 7 through 13 and the letter to the congregation at Philadelphia. She is marked. She is submissive and yield to her bridegroom, guarding and obeying the terms of his marriage covenant, the Torah. The bride loves her bridegroom with a perfect love, and she follows him, the lamb, wherever he goes. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 4, she has made herself ready by washing her garments in the blood of the lamb, and she has purified herself, separated herself totally unto him. She belongs to him and her relationship with him is intimate. He knows her and she knows him and their fellowship is sweet. She has an open door into the marriage on the Feast of Trumpet because she has not denied his name in Revelation chapter 3 verse 8 and she has also kept his word in other words his commandments Torah in Revelation chapter 3 verse 10 she is kept from the hour of temptation, which takes place during the 10 days of Ah, During these 10 days, the congregation of Smyrna is told that they must suffer tribulation for 10 days. So no man knows the hour. You would not know the hour if you're not rehearsing and keeping the feast days. Of the Most High God. Amen. 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 And amen. Ooh. So good. So good. So good. Close these mouths.
so good. Y'all enjoy this eighth day celebration. Shimmy Aretz. And then when the sun sets tonight, we go into Sim Kator, the joy of the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. I love the Most High because these are his what? Rehearsals. You are the bride. You're rehearsing. Waiting on the bridegroom. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Oh, no man knows the day or hour. I think we just blew that out the water, y'all. We done tore that down out the sky. No man knows the day nor the hour. A Hebrew in y'all. Meaning. Yom Tua. Ooh, we got to unlearn some stuff, y'all. I'm so serious. We got to unlearn some stuff. Now, don't forget. The next. Ugh, feast day. Which I love it. Hanukkah. Festival of Lights. is December the 23rd through the 30th. Uh-oh. There's another lie right there. We got to cast that thing out the sky. Because you know y'all say December the 25th. That's when Christ was born. We just came out of Sukkot. He was born during that season. Oh my goodness. I can't believe Hanukkah is the 23rd through the 30th. You go, Motai God. Oh yeah. We about to have a head-on collision with Christmas. Mm -mm -mm. We come to destroy every lie of the devil. High the time. We about to have a head-on collision with your little Christmas. What you say now? Because Hanukkah going to be on the 25th too. Shut your mouth and keep on talking. Oh, yeah. December the 23rd through the 20 through the 30th is Hanukkah. Ah, uh, who going to be saying Merry Christmas? I wonder. Come on here with that. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Who going to put up that nativity thing? Y'all know how y'all laid him in the manger and stuff. Say he was born in the manger. Mm -hmm. We're going to come with our Sukkot teaching all over again. Okay. So get to the blog spot, get to Facebook, get to YouTube. It will encourage you. Have a supernatural day two, but day eight, Shimmy Heret celebration. Because the Most High God said, I will just tarry with you a little while longer. Aren't you excited? Oh, he's amazing. Once you know the God that you're serving. Because when he said to Moses, said, who shall I say sent me? His response was, you tell Pharaoh, the God of the Hebrews have sent you. Ooh, Lord. All right now. Tell him, Dr. J, who sent you? The God of the Hebrews has sent me to Facebook Live to destroy every lie of the enemy. Because he said right here in Matthew this morning, many false Christs will come. And they are already here now. All right now. I love you, love you, love you. This was so good. Share this video. You know I love you. Bye now. So good. So, so good.